When you think about it in terms of what we're going through right now, which is a unprecedented, massive crisis and stressor to the entire world, right? And the commercial community in particular, um, it's really the, it's how quickly you can shift from an inevitable negative response to a challenge to a positive one. I can make my office as clean and as clear as possible, do all the things I read about, about how to be the most productive person. But if I'm waking up stressed, uncertain, fearful, right? And feeling like a victim or letting these things hijack me, uh, these sabotaging behaviors, then it really doesn't matter so much what I know. Hello, Sales Nation. I'm Will Barron, host of the Salesman Podcast, the world's most downloaded B2B sales show. On today's episode, we have Adam McGraw, who is the CRO over at Positive Intelligence. And you can find the book Positive Intelligence on Amazon. The website, everything else is linked to in the show notes of this episode over at salesman.org. And on this episode, we're getting into your self-sabotaging behaviors and how you can survive and thrive in this age of COVID-19 that we're living through right now, these times of uncertainty and a whole lot more. So let's jump right into it. Adam, welcome to the Salesman Podcast. Thanks, Will. Glad to be here. Happy Friday. Happy Friday. I'm glad to have you on, Adam. Okay, so on this show, we're going to dive into leveraging a positive intelligence during what we're going through right now. Um, and we're recording this on the 27th of January, February, March, uh, just for context in case things go good or bad from this point. So we're in context of this conversation, uh, leveraging positive intelligence during this time of crisis to improve our sales skills, our business skills, and then survive mentally, I guess, at home and everywhere else as well. So with that said, do you have a definition for what positive intelligence is? Yeah, absolutely. So the literal definition is the percentage of time our mind is serving us versus sabotaging us. So the positive intelligence quotient, kind of like IQ and EQ, it's a measurement indicator. And uh, when you think about it in terms of what we're going through right now, which is a unprecedented, massive crisis and stressor to the entire world, right? And the commercial community in particular, um, it's really the it's how quickly you can shift from an inevitable negative response to a challenge to a positive one. Uh, so that's really, you know, the essence of it. It's mental fitness. And if the more mentally fit you are, the faster you are able to actually go from what's a very natural human response to challenge and stress and be able to shift out of it and get to a positive, more clear, calm, laser focused, discerning perspective on everything. And is there, I'm, I'm discarding all the questions I was going to ask uh, straight off the bat here, Adam, which is a good sign. Is there a more powerful element of this? Because I guess we've got the carrot and we've got the, the, the carrot in front of us and the stick whipping us on the arse with, uh, to be motivated and to get stuff done here of the serving element of our, of our mindset, of our personality, of our uh, emotions versus the sabotaging element is if we could only focus on one, which we will in this, this podcast episode, is the one element that has a better bang for buck for fixing, learning and developing over the other one. You know, it's a good question, Will. I mean, the way we view the way that you actually get your arms around being more mentally fit or improving this positive intelligence level is um, on three different levels, right? So we kind of view it as a three-legged stool to comprehensive mental fitness. And it's actually kind of, you know, coincidentally similar to physical fitness. You have anaerobic strength, aerobic capacity and nutrition, that's your comprehensive physical fitness. And on the mental side, we break it down based on the 500,000 person research across 50 countries to your 10 root factors that of all the variable crazy ways we self-sabotage as a human species, right? The way that there's 10 at the root level um, through the research that we found that actually, you know, combine to actually be the sabotaging behaviors most of us revert to under stress, challenge and adversity in a survival mode. And then the middle kind of pillar or leg of the stool is self-command capacity. So, you know, being positive and being able to recover from negativity and setback at a more rapid pace isn't about insight. Most of us know that we're not serving ourselves when we're completely being hijacked by a bunch of negative emotions. Yeah. And we've got all this brain chatter and anger and frustration, and fear, et cetera. But our ability to actually shift out of that is 80% a muscle response and only 20% an insight response. So it's very different than our old adage of how you fix everything through reading books and watching videos and going to one day sessions. Um, those have about 10% success rates for actually rewiring your brain and creating new habits. And so that middle pillar is very important. We work on people's self-command capacity and we give you tangible, practical little exercises you can do literally in the middle of your workday to help you strengthen that. And then the third pillar of kind of comprehensive mental fitness or improving your PQ or positive intelligence level is what we refer to as the sage perspective. So using that same 500,000 person research, drilling it down to the root core factors 
that contribute to your most positive elements of your brain that bridge into and lead into every one of the emotional intelligence competencies. And that's simply simplified down to your ability to explore, empathize, navigate, innovate, and then ultimately take action. So those are kind of the three main segues. Which one's more important? Well, I would argue that the first step that we kind of, we, we kind of list them in that particular order sure. um, quite deliberately, because if you are not aware of your automatic knee jerk responses that you revert to, that you've been doing since you were a kid, by the way, when you face challenge, stress or adversity, your ability to shift and be calm, clear headed and focused and lever leverage any one of those five core sage perspective powers of EQ, like being empathetic is most likely not going to succeed. You have to get a hold of these sabotaging factors, things like the judge and the stickler and the controller and the victim and the avoider. And maybe you could, maybe you're willing to share a few of yours because I think you took the assessment. But those need to be identified, labeled and intercepted first. Will. Otherwise, you're kind of taking two steps forward and then two steps back. I totally agree. And this is something that we teach over at Salesman.org, a spin on this with the idea of productivity. So I found that no matter what books I read, training I did or anything like that, my productivity would stay the same. I'd just have more ways of measuring the lack of productivity that I had until I started to treat it as I guess we're doing here, but more of a dichotomy of you're either productive or you're not productive. So when I started removing the things that made me unproductive, like the Xbox, like just having a TV in the office. So it was supposed to be the idea that we could go and chill at lunchtime or when the UFC was on, we could come in and watch this. When I got rid of all that stuff and made the place slightly more sterile, productivity for me personally went massively through the roof because there was nothing else to do other than do the work. So I guess I guess it's similar to this here of if we can get rid of some of the things that are sabotaging us, the upside of that is, you know, mental health and productivity and all that stuff that comes along with it. Am I, am I on the right tracks here? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a really cool analogy. I mean, you, you're, you're mentioning a lot of external factors that we'll sometimes try and address when we know we're trying to get to a place of peak performance or peak productivity. And then there's the level below that, right, is, okay, but what's happening inside our own brains, right? I can make my office as clean and as clear as possible, do all the things I read about, about how to be the most productive person. But if I'm waking up stressed, uncertain, fearful, right, and feeling like a victim or letting these things hijack me, mm -hmm. uh, these sabotaging behaviors, then it really doesn't matter so much what I know because my ability to tap into them and mobilize Anything that's on the IQ or EQ spectrum or anything I've been investing in myself on from a skill perspective is most likely going to be inhibited and not unleashed to its full potential. Got it. Okay. So we'll have this conversation with the uh, global pandemic in mind that's going on, which yep. is going to be causing uh, panic or, or unease and, and distress. So we'll keep the conversation with that and we'll have you back on in the future, hopefully when this is all over to have a more general conversation perhaps. So I did the um, the assessment and I got the top results were controller, restless, hyper-rational and hyper-achiever. And as I went through the, and we'll link to the assessment in the show notes of this episode over at salesman.org. But as I went through the documentation that comes with it, the the breakdowns. It was no surprise to me, any of this. Yet, I know uh, in hindsight, it's almost like having someone over your shoulder telling you what's going wrong during the day. And I, I know that uh, a lot of these elements kind of do hold me back in certain ways. So perhaps we can go through a couple of these. We won't go through all of them on, on, on the episode itself. The audience can go through and the, the assessment does a lot of this legwork for them. But how about the controller and the uh, hyper-rational side of things? How would those elements hold someone back? How would they sabotage someone who perhaps also has those traits? Well, first of all, Will, that kudos to you for being so openly transparent in the essence of the subject, right? That's awesome. Uh, and I share a couple of those same saboteurs when I'm under stress and challenge. But yeah, as, as examples, right, this tendency or propensity to be a controller under stress, challenge, and adversity means that you literally think that the only way you can get things done, whether you're in an individual environment or a team operating environment, is if you can control every single little detail and everything that you can't control starts to drive you completely wild mm -hmm. and you get very frustrated, very angry. And these things are so subconscious that they're radiating from you. People around you know that you're a major controller, but many, many controllers struggle with their ability to even think they have that tendency. And that's a really, think about being in the, in the profession of sales and in an environment like we're in right now, where empathy and the ability to navigate and explore with customers all of the unprecedented challenges they're going through, and you're still leaning on your controller to get through a sales call, talk about shooting yourself in the foot and probably not getting off to a great start, 
right? I mean, mm -hmm. this ability to be emotionally intelligent is completely shut down when you're just automatically leaning on that to such. Again, these things at their core, right? Controlling things at a moderate level isn't necessarily a bad trait, nor is being vigilant, right? But it's when, just like putting your hand on a stove is a very positive pain signal that we need to know this is hot. But what do we do when we put our hand on the stove and we realize this is hot? We immediately remove it because we know that keeping our hand on the stove only leads to the flesh burning off and there's no benefit in that. And that's the difference of these hijacking saboteurs is that when they're take overtaking us, some people go hours, days, weeks, and months with these things running their days and their performance. And there's no benefit in that, right? And so it's just this extreme version of them. And I think your other question was then, um, you said you said controller and what was the second one? I said hyper-rational, but let's look at hyper-achiever because I think that will be very specific to an audience of salespeople who are led day-to-day -day by achieving numbers on a screen and a page, right? Yeah, so so hyper-achiever is one of my highest scoring ones. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, I think a lot of hyper-achievers, when they first hear this, even though, as you point out in the assessment, it tells you your thoughts, your feelings, and the most important thing, your justification lies that you tell yourself as to why you need this to be successful or get through challenging times is you kind of say, how is that a bad thing? How is it a bad thing to be striving for greatness, right? Again, in excess, if only, if all of your happiness and your ability to control your stress and all of your self-identification is tied to accolades and results and achievements, particularly when things are like they are right now, then you might be a very frustrated, stressed, or feeling very insignificant right now. And that is not a great place to be, right? That's, it's very uh, impactful to your relationships. It's impactful to your happiness. And ultimately it ends up becoming impactful to your performance because you end up being, you know, some people end up getting in a place where they start becoming overly pressing, overly desperate. And, um, and that's not a spot to be in, in a, you know, in an environment that needs consultative, you know, exploratory selling. So it seems to me like each of these saboteur traits are on a sliding scale, right? And yeah day-to-day -day in a sales role, some of these may be uh, positive or it depends how you look at them and, and how they influence you, but they could potentially be positive or they could be negative. They could pull you one way or the other, um, depending on the sliding of the scale. But right now, I think a lot of salespeople run at 97% of capacity and then all of these things crop up in the environment, whether it is COVID-19, whether it is uh, your business restructuring and you've got the risk of being like, go, oh, whatever it is that's going to happen in the economy over the next uh, few months and probably years moving forward. And so that can probably tip people over the edge of, of stress, which makes all of this house of cards fall to pieces. So with that all said, if I'm on the right tracks here, uh, Adam, how do we go about, I guess the first step is identifying this. How do we go about then changing the wiring or our habits um, so the, on a high level, so that we can then uh, almost give ourselves the uh, the ability or the uh, what I'm getting at is how do we get to a point where we have a, almost like a success mindset rather than a fixed mindset where we can say I am capable of changing these things because that must be step two. Yeah, you're right. I mean th th that is essentially what we're trying to get folks to realize is the growth mindset approach mm -hmm. or having or tapping into emotional intelligence or all these things that we've spent a lot of time and money in for the last 10, 15, 20 years all require you to have control of this positive intelligence framework to be mentally fit, right? Your ability to tap into them and do them more often is completely contingent upon it. And so your point right now, we're seeing massive levels and massive what we call vortexes being created because this is very contagious, by the way. When people are hijacked negatively by their saboteurs, whatever theirs may be, it's a very, very contagious thing that happens. It's its own version of a pandemic, right? Mm -hmm. And right now, the most common one that's being elicited is one that's not even very common for some people during non-stress times, which is hypervigilance. People are taking their stress, their worry, their anxiety over all the uncertainty, and they're going overboard, right? They're getting so hypervigilant that they literally can't think about anything else, and it's ruining their days. It's, ru it's clouding their judgment, and they're not tapping into their EQ. So we have to give them the tools to start to build the mental muscle not just the insight, right? To actually gain control over this, particularly when stress happens. And it, ha and it happens a little bit gradually. I mean, look, when we put people through our programs, you can actually see differences in MRI imaging based on different parts of the brain that start highlighting because people work on this diligently over a six week period, spending just 10 to 15 minutes a day, strengthening their mental muscle to actually be able to identify these negative habits, shift into a calm, clear headed and focused space and tap one of the sage perspective powers that I mentioned, right? those that three-step operating system that is that is can happen in as short as six weeks but in the long run it's like thinking about physical fitness right 
You don't go into the gym and say, today I'm going to, even though I've never done it before, <laughs> squat 350 pounds for 25 reps. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows that's a recipe for failure. This is a long game. It's a lifestyle choice. And you have to start to put the discipline and the structure and the cadence in to gradually over time be able to handle larger and larger challenges where those saboteurs that were once a, a 100, score of 100, when you were being hijacked by stress and adversity are now able to be kept at a 10 or a 20 level, right? Because you're strengthening that component to catch them quicker and shift. And so we put people through app guided platforms and programs because we know everyone's addicted to their phone anyhow. And it's a positive disruptor to all the negative disruptions you get on the phone um, for your mentality and your mindset. And we help people go through a process where they get very strong at identifying and intercepting these sabotaging habits they have after taking the assessment. And that's different for everyone. Yours is different than mine as you're going through it. They're practicing on a daily basis what we refer to as PQ reps. These are little 10 second hyper focuses on any one of your senses, which you can do in environments like this right now, once you start doing them enough, or in conference rooms, or whenever you need them to quiet the brain chatter and essentially experience the very same thing we all crave that for those of us that are really into yoga, mindfulness, meditation, et cetera, but hyper practical and hyper conducive for the very busy um, and, and overachieving type of individual. And then that third piece is, okay, what, you know, you said, yes, some of these sabotaging behaviors, they have their positives, again, only in moderation, though, only at the very moderate level, because when you are under the influence of those sabotaging behaviors, you feel negative emotions. That's the easiest way to identify this. If you're feeling negative emotions and things feel hard, like a grind, et cetera, you better check yourself. You're most likely under the influence and being hijacked by a sabotaging behavior, which means you are not pulling one of the levers of that sage perspective where all your EQ sits. You're not empathizing, exploring, innovating, navigating, or taking action. And if you're a salesperson or you're a sales leader, those five words, right? When you think about all the things you've ever been taught emotional intelligence wise, or in any of your selling classes are imperative. You need to be thinking about one of those levers in order to do anything and be intellectually nimble enough, right? To navigate, you know, a very, very challenging customer environment right now. Do you, this is, this will make sense when I, when I wrap this up, but Adam, do you watch or are you watching uh, the TV show Westworld? I, I do not, no. Okay, no, but so- I, I won't ruin it for anyone. Um, essentially, in the not too distant future, they build a theme park full of robots. The robots are on what they call these loops. So they wake up every morning and they do the same thing over and over. And if they get attacked by humans or whatever, they go and rebuild and then put on these loops. The theme of the new season of the show is the robots are now out of this park. And there's all this parody of humans being on loops and going through the same things over and over. And the main character, who is Jesse from Breaking Bad, uh, Aaron Paul, that's his name, the actor, he is uh, working on a construction site, gets up, hates his life, goes to work, comes home, is having therapy for um, some, some issue he had in a war or something that went along those lines. And it's going back and forth between the fact that we look at these robots and they're just running in these loops all day. And now they're looking at us, us now that they've become conscious and there's a lot of humans running in these loops all day. So the reason I asked that, Adam, is how much of all of this is the fact that we don't take a moment to, I know I don't want to get all hippie and talk about uh, you know meditation and sitting on a rock in the in the desert for six months <laughs> and all that side of things. And I, I use uh, meditation apps, so I'm sold on the science of meditation. Um, but sure. I don't I don't want to sound like a hippie to the audience as I go through this. But how much of this is the ability to train yourself to be able to stop and be conscious and and be in that present in that moment versus what a lot of us do because we're busy because the news is hammering us. We're all constantly in these loops, these cycles of of, of news. And and if it, if it wasn't coronavirus this week and this probably next few months, it'd be something else that we're all wrapped up in. How much of all of this is just stopping and being, for want of a better word, centered for two or three minutes and, and taking back control over these loops that we're all probably running through? Well, uh, I, I would assume for different people, it's it's a different uh, weight as far as how much it impacts their daily loop. A great analogy, right? This automatic habitual response mm -hmm. where there's literal neural pathways that you've been building yeah. and strengthening for 30, 40, 50 years. And now we're asking you to think about how you shift that and start building new ones. Um, I, it's it's one third on, on, the, on the scientific component, right? Because like I said, what we review is mental fitness is three pillars and it's pillar, it's the middle pillar, right? This That mind control under pressure and adversity, that ability to shift be calm, clear-headed, and laser-focused like a kind of like a Jedi warrior is, how the martial artists train themselves to be unbelievably focused amidst even the, every bit of adversary that they or adversity they fit um, uh, meet is is absolutely one-third of it. But for some people, 
I would argue for most people we've noticed so far, it's the one that's been least uh, approached and least practiced. And so it's the weakest link. You know, people can quickly learn, these are my sabotaging behaviors. And they can quickly learn, these are my five sage powers that leads to all of my emotional intelligence. But that middle indicator, to your point, because even if you're really into yoga and really into meditation and you do a lot of running and you're very physically fit, can you, in the middle of a conversation with a customer that's heated, in the middle of a uh, altercation with a uh, relationship that you have, can you pause, stop, not let yourself get hijacked and shift and use one of those emotional intelligence pillars? Most people don't. Most people do things under the major stress and adversity like we're facing right now that ultimately they regret and they go, I should have done something like this. Right. Or they can teach someone and tell them how to do it. But then when they go to do it, they can. And it's, it's about if you look at um, on the spectrum of all the research we've done, tw only 20 percent of people are typically able to do this uh, and be able to stay centered, calm, clear headed and focused under stress and adversity. So when they hit their free throw line and the game's on the line, they can be cool, calm and collected and shoot it as if nobody else was in the gym. Eighty percent of people fall victim to the vortex of this subconscious habitual loop that you were referencing, where they're most likely going to be in more of a choking circumstance or do something where the negative emotions get a hold of them and they ultimately end up not rising to the occasion and reaching peak potential. I love it because I, I, I've never been able to, I, you've put it into um, a structure here and obviously there's data behind it and it's measurable. But I've noticed sure. this in salespeople, the best salespeople, I've talked about this on the show before, you ask them a question and there's always a slight hesitation before they answer back, a slight pause where obviously they are in control of their response, their emotion, their EQ and all that good stuff. And then they think about it and then they give you a response. Salespeople who are, you know, the, the people who thrived in the 80s and 90s, the people who had the gift of the gab, who could just blag their way for everything are just bam, 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 bam. And they're not really listening to what you're saying. And because of that, they're not really able to give you uh, 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 an answer. And I've noticed this I don't know, maybe uh, the guys over at gong.io do a lot of uh, data um, processing with voice conversations in sales. Maybe they maybe they can measure that pause or there's, there's, there's a hesitation or there's something that they can process. But I find this really interesting. So with all that said, let's get practical here um, to, to wrap up the show here, Adam. Hypervigilance is clearly going to be a saboteur for everyone right now because the news cycle is so pressing. We're all, a lot of the, the population is under some form of quarantine throughout the world. So we are getting bombarded by these messages even more. So this is probably raising the, the, the stakes of it all, whether that's real for you or whether that's perceived for you, depending on your environment that you're in. How do we, using these three legs of the pillar of, of the sabotaging behaviors of um, being in control and, and the sage perspectives, how do we manage this? hypervigilance in this situation that may be a once in a, a decade, once in a lifetime scenario that we find ourselves in right now? Well, it, we're going to spend a lot of time um, offering some free value and putting out some webinars and videos. Shirzad, the, the New York Times bestselling author of this subject and leader of the research who lectures on this at Stanford is already starting to push out videos because we can see just how pressing this, this saboteur is right now in our current environment. Um, it's, it's not a quick answer, but to just try and summarize it, um, first step is realizing that it's happening, right? realizing there is a vortex happening out there. And this is not mitigating the severity of the situation, right? I don't want to sit here. I know people are losing their jobs. They're being furloughed. They're watching loved ones die and not being able to attend funerals or visit them in the hospital. I mean, this is unprecedented emotional stuff. Um, that said, everyone's in their own predicament where there's a certain amount of time that they're most likely letting some of this get to them more than it should. And it's impacting everything. It's impacting relationships, stress and happiness, and ultimately productivity that most of us are still forced to figure out a way to do yep. through this, right? And, and so you've got two choices, right? It's the old, if you in, visualize your house is burning down, you've got two choices of how this is gonna happen, right? You're either going to run around frantically and you've got six family members in the house and a couple of animals, and you're gonna be, oh my gosh, you're gonna be screaming. You're just gonna be kind of moving all around, not really any strategy or tactics to go, to go with it. And meanwhile, we know time is of the essence, right? Or you're going to say, okay, this is a major crisis. You're going to remain calm, clear-headed, and focused. You're going to think about what's the area of the house that you need to get to first. Who are the people that can be a part of the assistance plan, right? There's such a difference in the way that you can be vigilant and still get through with maximum preparedness, but not do so at the detriment of what we know is not going to help us or help the people that we want to get through it with us, right? We're trying to lead our families. We're trying to lead our companies and our teams. 
We need people that can be calm, clear headed and focused when this house is burning down. Uh, it's a severe analogy, but these are severe times. Right. And I think that, you know, everyone's got their different knee jerk responses. Again, some people, maybe they aren't falling fixed to the hypervigilance. Maybe they're falling more to the victim and the avoider and and the restless. Right. Mm -hmm. But all of those are negatively clouding your judgment. And, and it's and the brain chatter is impacting your ability to use all of your intelligence that you know is best suited for you to, again, explore, empathize, navigate, innovate, and ultimately act your way through this. Because right now it's winter. Well, I view, right? This, this, is a, this is a really dark, hard, long winter. And those sales folks and those people that do have roles and, and are whatever predicament you're in, the people that are staying focused and getting through this and planting as many seeds as they possibly can, or ultimately, because we know, we know spring will come, are going to watch themselves spring forward at a faster pace. They're going to recover faster. Uh, and, and that's really what we want to try and help people do, right? We want to reverse this 80-20 trend where 80% of people are getting automatically hijacked and not reaching their full potential to get through this and maintain their sanity. And only 20% are. We want to try and flip that on its head and do anything we can to help. So is it fair to say then to the audience, and we'll, we'll leave it on this, Adam, that if they are feeling hijacked, I love this word, or I've, I wrote down something else, but I've totally cannot read my own handwriting. But if they are getting these automatic responses, they feel hijacked, the first step for them is to go through, read the book and go through the uh, the online assessment and, and get some data from there and get some information about themselves. But also to perhaps go, right, every morning while I'm working from home, I'm going to be in sat for the computer, dressed to, in a work appropriate outfit with trousers on at 9 a.m. And I'm going to do this, this, and this, and this. And then perhaps we'll let the afternoon kind of develop and see what's going on. And perhaps even, I'm not even going to watch the news that morning until I've done a bit of productive work so it can't physically derail me. Is that, um, am I on the right track? So that is a good structure for someone's day to relieve some of this pressure that they are getting this automatic hijacking from all external stimulus that's been thrown at you. Uh, can, can join this time. Yeah, I think I think it is a good piece of advice uh, that you point out. Well, I mean, let's face it: if you're if you're to told to go on a crash diet and you need to get in the best peak condition physically of your life, first thing they advise you to do is throw out all of the temptations, mm -hmm. right? Throw out all the temptations. Don't leave it. Don't stare at it every day in the fridge. All of your vices and your weaknesses, right? Get that out of there so that you can take one step forward. That being said, you still got to go to the gym, right? Even if you throw out all of the external factors that pull you into the vortex of not being successful in the end, you got to sweat, you got to practice, you've got to be disciplined and regimented. And so I think our recommendation to people that say, Hey, look, yeah, I am. If I were to rate myself on a daily basis, the percent of time I'm under the influence of negative emotions versus positive, which is the almost the complete simplified way to look at this, right? Yeah. Is you would a get yourself some insight on it, which we do have the book there. Um, that's been out for a while. The New York times bestseller B take the assessments. They're free and they're better than most self assessments that I took when I was running businesses at Amex. Uh, and they're completely complimentary. And usually people say they're spot on and then see, we do offer an app guided platform. That's essentially your gym, right? So it's like, it's kind of in the meditation space, they're offering you apps and everything, but it's a gym with specific regimentation to be your digital executive coach to help you 10 to 15 minutes a day, usually every three hours to be able to pause and continue to practice the three pillars of over overcoming your mental fitness deficiencies, which is identifying these sabotaging behaviors, practicing on your self-command capacity to shift positive when you're under stress and unleashing and mobilizing the sage perspective that leads to all of your emotional intelligence. That's the regimentation that people that are really serious about it go through because then this essentially becomes, well, when you do this, this becomes your simplified version and operating system mentally mm -hmm. for every other application, skill-wise, personal or professional productivity-wise that you want to actually improve on you have this at the baseline, right? You ensure that it's never going to be your mindset that's a detriment and an inhibitor. That's always going to be the jet fuel to anything that you're investing time, energy, and money into. And that's what we really want to try and help people understand is this is a three-step operating system. So all your apps that you're looking at on a daily basis, all the books you read, all the podcasts you go on are going to work in it and over the long haul. Got it. Well, I'll link to the book, um, Positive Intelligence, the website, the apps, everything else, and some details for yourself over at salesman.org. One final question to wrap things up here, Adam. Other than the obvious that salespeople are more likely going to be working from home, offices are going to shrink, people are going to be sharing desks uh, to save office space in the future, most probably, and the idea of a boiler room sales team is probably going to disappear over the next decade, if, if not over the next few years after this COVID-19 crisis. Is there anything else you think is going to change business, is going to change salespeople specifically moving forward? 
Yeah, I mean, I think there were things that were already changing that are going to hit tipping points because of this, right? This whole kind of evolution towards more and more people being virtual. I mean, I spent my whole B2B sales career virtual at Amex. Uh, you know, I think that'll stick for a lot of companies that are doing it as a temporary band-aid. Um, I think that this whole trend towards mindfulness, mm -hmm. there's going to be more and more companies buying into the fact because right now they're going to watch a lot of employees go through major personal and professional stress and unhappiness and depression and things that are really challenging and impactful to their daily productivity. And, and, then, and then I think the third thing is going to be, okay, we've talked a lot about emotional intelligence. How well is the payout been, right? How can we actually create operationalized ways that people deliver and mobilize that emotional intelligence? I, I've, I've been arguing for quite a while that most of us have been empathetic at times in our lives when we want to. We've been good <laughs> listeners when we want to. Mm -hmm. So how do you give people the tools to know how to be empathetic even when they don't feel like it or when the person across from them isn't being very empathetic? That's the art of selling as we become a more um, automated and digital sales environment is these people that master how to unleash and mobilize EQ are gonna be, get the edge and they're always gonna have job security and they're always gonna be the ones creating the new vision for all the companies that are coming up with really great um, technology and digital applications that helps to, you know, simplify the selling process as well. That's my opinion for what it's worth, you know? It, it's, it's worth a lot to me. That makes a lot of sense. And with Adam, I appreciate your time today. I appreciate you running through this with me. And uh, I'm, I've got a lot of notes to scribble down to go back over myself to explore some of this in more detail. So with that, mate, I want to thank you for your time and for joining us on the Salesman Podcast. Absolutely. Well, thanks to you, man. Great talking to you.